Well, many of you know uh, know Armin and, and know that he got his PhD at, at Caltech, but you may not know that he's a uh, home home boy, homebred, went to University High School. I happen oh. to know that a good authority. He was a classmate of my stepson, Brian Adams. So uh, I've known known uh, him and his family. Sarush, of course, was here at the U for a while, his dad, um, and, uh, and he's followed in his footsteps. Uh, we're very lucky to have him, as, um, as Kirsten said. Uh, he's got an amazing track record after Caltech. He was doing work on aerosol particles in a NOAA operation. Um, came back to his undergraduate institution, the U of A, to start teaching. Holds appointments in about four or five different apart departments. Um, has been a speaker in this Environmental Breakfast Club series before. Uh, it's uh, on, part, on aerosol particles and climate change and uh, the opportunity to bring him back and talk about his continuing work there and also the application in COVID was, uh, was just uh, an amazing thing to, to, to have. Uh, the university uh, provost uh, named him a university distinguished scholar in 2016, which is a really high mark. It's one of the very most distinguished things you can do for a long, young scholar and um, entirely deserved. So, um, Kirsten, you want to add anything to that? No, just I'm very excited for his talk and very glad you invited him, uh, Robert, and that he's willing to come back. Uh, and uh, I think it's a uh, probably we should get we should start imminently, though. Um, um, I'm sure people have been very distracted this morning with some of the election results. Sounds like we have a little bit of a, a smaller participants uh, numbers today, but on the other hand, this is being recorded and so uh, people will be able to uh, see it at a later time. Sure. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Robert Kirsten, for the uh, nice introduction. So I'm Really happy to be here to share a little bit about my work. Um, everything my research entails re revolves around these little particles in the air, which often are re referred to as aerosols. So the most common type that you're familiar with here in Arizona, at least, is dust. It turns out aerosols impact a whole bunch of different things um, that affect your daily lives that I'd like to tell you about today. Um, so this, this is a pretty breathtaking picture here on this slide, and I, I don't think we appreciate enough how beautiful um, the atmosphere really can be when you look down from space. I think especially these days with all the crazy stuff going on, we should look more at stuff like this. And I particularly want you to look at the clouds, and you know, there's clouds of all different types of shapes, morphologies, sizes. Clouds are incredibly complicated. Uh, the ancient philosophers like Descartes said that if anyone can explain how a cloud works, then they can surely explain how anything in nature works. It's the hardest thing. They're incredibly dynamic, complex, and uh, I'm happy to be able to be able to study them. Um, just like a tree needs a seed to grow, clouds need a seed to grow, and those are these aerosols. So with that, um, first want to start with my acknowledgments. Uh, when I was on the uh, on the stage uh, uh, 10 years ago, like Robert said, I could not make this slide. I only had the top left student with me right when I was starting. But since then, these are all the graduate students I've had in my group with a couple postdocs and visiting scientists. So um, I really want to acknowledge them for getting us to the point we're at today to, to help describe the, some of the new missions that I'm involved with. The funding has largely come from NASA and the Office of Naval Research for all the research that I do with little tiny bits from NSF and NIEHS. So uh, as long as you're not refreshing election results and you're listening, I hope to be able to have you be able to answer these questions at the end of the hour, okay? What are aerosols and what are their impacts? What's the link between aerosols and clouds? Why are these interactions so confusing and how can we reduce the uncertainty? And lastly, what is the role of aerosols in this COVID-19 uh, story? Okay, so with that, I want to begin with this really nice animation. I like to always show this, and it's, it's, it's really a remarkable animation. It's a NASA product, and it gives you a little bit of an appreciation for how aerosols work. Um, unlike other things in the environment, aerosols have no boundaries. 
this is important for regulatory activities. You know, <laughs> aerosols don't care where political lines are, states, countries, continents, they'll go wherever they want. And the most polluted days we've had in Tucson on record in the past decades had nothing to do with pollution from the US. It came from China, um, specifically from the desert, the Gobi Desert, places like that. It takes about a week for that aerosol to move to the West Coast and subside. So in the legend on the bottom, you can see what the colors mean. So dust is red. So you can see the Saharan Desert, of course, the Middle East, Asia, big hotspots. In green, you have organic and black carbon. And that basically comes from vegetation, trees, and especially biomass burning. So the hotspots are the Amazon, southern half of Africa, especially. White represents sulfates. So that's from combustion. It's an anthropogenic tracer. So East Asia, lots of hotspots, Eastern half of the US, Europe. Lastly, we have sea salt, which is uh, really important globally because oceans cover some 71% of the global surface area. And when waves break, sea salt goes in the air. Um, so the natural aerosol types, dust and sea salt, really account for the majority of aerosol by mass globally. But when it comes to number, the actual number of particles in the air, it's these other types, like the organics, the black carbon, the sulfates. And those are the ones that might have more of an effect on health and things like clouds and climate. So particles, I should note, range in size widely from a couple nanometers up to several hundreds of microns. That's, even though they're so small, they have a disproportionately large impact on us. And one of the first effects that particles have on us is contaminant transport, which is a big topic of research on campus for people in the environmental arena. This is a really interesting two-dimensional space that kind of motivates air and that it's maybe not received as much attention as it should. Um, there's a lot of focus on water and soil, but those types of media have long tra transport times and very small characteristic spatial scales of transport. Air in contrast, has a short transport time scale. That's challenging for us on the measurement side. Okay, aerosols only last in the air for about a week or two because they're rained out. So it, and while they are in the air, they're always changing. Their, their chemistry is always changing because of reactions. Plus on the x-axis, they are continental and global in scale in terms of their impact. So the combination of the two axes shows that air really is a big deal. And the shading represents the level of attention in the peer reviewed literature, at least when it comes to environment, at least when it comes to contaminant transport. So more uh, focus is needed on air as compared to more popular things like water. Why else do particles matter? Well, maybe the most tangible effect on us here in the Southwest is visibility. So maybe you've been caught on one of these devastating dust plumes on I-10. I know I have on a couple occasions. They are terrifying. They will come out of nowhere and visibility can quickly drop to about zero. And most people, like uh, even local people out of towners don't really know what to do, which is uh, pull over, turn your lights off. And um, that confusion leads to these problems, often fatalities. So that the stretch actually between Picacho Peak and Eloy may be one of the most dangerous stretches for dust in this country. So this problem does not just exist in Tucson, it's many parts of the world. Um, you know, a third, uh, over a third of the continental global uh, areas, semi-arid, arid regions. But the issue of visibility extends to cities like, you know, in Los Angeles, which is where I was for my grad school days. This is a picture I took on top of the Caltech uh, a building on campus where I was doing my research looking at the San Gabriel Mountains to the north. And you can see clearly <laughs> mountains on some days, no mountains on other days. And this is because particles scatter light and this reduces visibility. Uh, if larger particles can scatter more light and at a fixed size, depending on your composition, you can scatter more or less light. So the, these properties matter that we're trying to measure in our research. So the cleanest day on average in this country is Sunday. And the most polluted day is Thursday and Friday because of the buildup of pollution during the work week. All right, why else do particles matter? Um, of course, public health. Okay, so 
uh, when you breathe, you're not just inhaling air, you're inhaling particles, lots of them, um, anywhere from a few tens to a few thousands of particles per cubic centimeter. So if you think about what a cubic centimeter is, that's a lot of particles, and they don't all actually deposit. Some of them actually come out, but some of them do deposit, and depending on where and what they're made of, they can do some pretty nasty things to us, both in the acute and chronic uh, categories. Um, the World Health Organization said a few years ago that of all environmental threats, aerosols kill more people globally than anything else, including water. And most of this is, has to do with actually indoor air pollution, not outdoor air pollution, because of problems like what you see here. Indoor cooking in areas without ventilation are a big problem around the, in parts of the world, and elder, elder, elderly people are especially vulnerable to these problems. But aerosols do something good in the health arena. Um, if you're like me and have asthma, you rely on the little uh, puffer albuterol drug, which is aerosolized medicine. So it's funny, the uh, aerosols give you the problem, then you fix the problem with aerosols. So um, aerosols do good and bad things. And of course the COVID stuff, these are viruses and aerosols. And I'll try to get to that at the end of the talk. So public health is a big issue. Uh, you might ask, uh, why, what is the connection between particles in this picture? Um, well, it turns out the color of your sunsets depends on two things, wavelength of light and the size and number of particles and droplets in the air between your eyes and the sun. So if you think about the spectral palette of a rainbow, you know, Roy G. Biv, uh, the shorter wavelengths, of course, are violet and blue, the longer ones are orange and red. So in the middle of the day, like you know, right now, um, air molecules love to scatter those shorter wavelengths like blue. And that's why the sky is blue to us. You know, Air scatters blue light 16 times better than red light. At the end of the day, light has to travel a longer distance because the sun is farther away from us. So all those shorter wavelengths get attenuated, scattered out, leaving the longer wavelengths. And if there's enough particles and droplets in the air, you know, we get a nice canvas to print nature's colors. You get all these beautiful reds and oranges. So when you're on the porch, you know, enjoying your glass of wine next time and you got a scene like this, you should thank our neighbors to the West, Phoenix, Los Angeles, places like Asia. The more they pollute, uh, the prettier uh, your experience will be. Okay. And in history, it's been said that volcanoes lead to some of the best sunsets. And uh, this is true because volcanoes spew out tons of stuff in the air that goes high where there's no clouds to rain it out. So those particles actually last longer and give beautiful sunsets. So the 1883 eruption of Krakatoa in Indonesia was said to inspire this famous painting that maybe you've seen. It's called The Scream. Okay, so the last important effect of aerosols that I'll focus on is that of um, how particles affect the energy balance climate. So um, particles actually cool the planet, whereas greenhouse gases warm the planet. And this is because when sun shines down, particles are bigger than gas molecules, and they actually reflect sunlight back up right away. <laughs> gases instead let the light go through them, reach the Earth's surface, be re-radiated back up as what's called long wave radiation. Then the gases trap that and send it back down. That's the greenhouse effect, the warming we get. But particles do a very different thing. They actually cool us. How much that cooling offsets the warming is a question still, okay? So when you look at this, this is the Mount Pinatubo eruption of the Philippines in 1991. You can imagine that this big thick plume of ash, sulfates and smoke probably affects the ability of sunlight to reach the Earth's surface. That's true, it's because these particles reflect light. So after the Pinatubo eruption, actually the global mean surface temperature dropped by one to two degrees Celsius for a couple of years. And we had very beautiful sunsets too. This is a really like excellent natural experiment to show us just how influential particles are on climate. So this is called the direct effect on climate because particles directly reflect light of the space. The more complicated issue is the indirect effect, which is particles making clouds, which then reflect light back up the space. Go out? So this is a satellite image off the coast of Alaska. 
So you can see the ocean is dark, so it'll absorb radiation, but the clouds are very white, very reflective. So the question is, why is this issue of clouds so complicated? Well, it's because there's two things that really control clouds. The seeds, you got to have the seeds, particles, but also meteorology. Okay, so if you walk outside right now, uh, you're not going to have a cloud next to you because you need more favorable meteorological conditions. You need to have strong updraft velocities and something called a super saturation. That's a fancy word for relative humidity, just has to go a hair over 100%. So if you look around Tucson on a given day, if there's any place that has a cloud, um, most likely it's going to be on top of a mountain. And that's because air is forced to go up orographic uplift, which leads to this supersaturation. Disentangling the two effects, aerosol and meteorology, is extremely difficult to do. And that's what the challenge is in our community. These interactions between aerosols and clouds are the biggest uncertainty in simulating climate. Okay, so one thing that's actually helped us study these are these really bright white lines you can see on this satellite image. Okay, <laughs> so if you look outside on a given day, sometimes you'll see lines in the sky. Those are jet contrails. These are not those. This is something very different. These are called ship tracks. Okay, so over the ocean, it's pretty darn clean. You know, just to give an idea, uh, you might have about 50 to 100 particles per cubic centimeter, mostly sea salt. When you're behind a massive cargo ship, you have upwards of 100,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And if those particles and those narrow plumes go into a cloud, they can make the cloud brighter. And I'm going to show you how. Here, there's a little cartoon. So two clouds. The key detail here is that both clouds have the same amount of liquid water, except they have different levels of particles around them. So the more polluted cloud on the right will have more but smaller cloud droplets. Yeah, it is. Okay, so what that means is that when sun shines down, that more polluted cloud will reflect more light back up because there's more surface area of droplet. This is called the Toomey effect. And in fact, it's named after Sean Toomey, who is a famous professor here at the U of A in atmospheric sciences. He passed away a few years ago. He wrote one of the most important papers in our field in the 70s. Uh, it's, so it's, this is called the Toomey effect. The other effect, though, is the polluted cloud not only is more reflective and has a cooling effect, but it also generates less rain. Because to make rain, cloud droplets have to grow a lot. And if all your droplets are small, they have the same speeds, they don't really collide and coalesce well. So you have suppressed precipitation, too. Yeah, it gets more complicated than this, but this is the simplest conceptual way to describe our science. Okay. This is another analogy to the ship track. So if you have two jars next to each other with the same weight of glass balls, except the jar on the right has smaller balls, but more of them, it will appear brighter to you. So this is the same thing as having a ship track versus a clean cloud over the ocean. OK, and so this is a really important chart from the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a very important report that comes out every few years. And it summarizes, due to our anthropogenic emissions, how do different factors on this planet warm or cool us? So if you're on the right side of zero, that means you have a warming effect. You have a positive radiative forcing. So that's all these greenhouse gases like CO2. They warm us. I want to draw your attention to this little category. These are the two aerosol effects. They have a cooling effect. And these error bars actually are important. So the aerosol cloud interactions I highlight in the blue box, that is the biggest error bar. So this is my job security slide. If you look on the far left, we have an L. It's the lowest level of confidence of the radiative forcing effect. This is a big deal for us because we're trying to get a better understanding of climate change. So we need to reduce that error bar. Aerosol cloud interactions are hard to understand. To understand. So, so why are these uncertainties so big? Well, it's hard to study them. You can't really bring the system down into a lab and study it in a controlled environment. Models can't really do much. Satellites rely on snapshots to look at a really complicated puzzle. So we really actually have to go into these clouds if possible. And that's what I've devoted most of my career to, airborne measurements. I want to highlight an experiment we did a few years ago. 
off the coast of California. This was a quite an interesting one. We often fly off the coast of California hoping to go find ships and often we can't find them. So we said one summer, what the heck, let's get our own ship. This is the research vessel Point Sur. It's an NSF uh, platform. We instrumented the ship and we had a bunch of jugs of oil donated to us that we had on the ship. And we got a couple smoke generators off of eBay for about a couple hundred bucks. Okay. <laughs> so I, I still laugh at this when I think about what we did. We, went out for a two week cruise and evaporated the oil from this point sir vessel. We generated a smoke plume that we knew where it would be. And then I would come on the Twin Otter aircraft, this little plane with two pilots chasing the plume. We chased the plume below the cloud, in the cloud, and we wanted to see how the cloud would be perturbed by the plume. Okay, this is at the heart of understanding aerosol cloud interactions. So, uh, it actually worked one day, we made a ship track. So this got some press. Uh, so if you look at the little yellow box right off the coast of Monterey Bay, and you zoom in here. So this morning for about six, six hours, 20 minutes, we emitted smoke along this path shown in the colored bars here. And then we extrapolated where the plume would be during the time of the satellite picture. So you can see it exactly matches where the bright cloud area is compared to the surrounding areas. So we, we made a ship track, <laughs> but um, the, it's all fun and games, you know, to show that this is happening, but really the problem is how do you simulate this stuff in a model? You actually have to have detailed data to say for X amount of aerosol, how much will the cloud reflectivity change? That part is really hard to do. That's why we need to collect more data. Okay, so how do we do our flights? So that was all the ship and the satellite. Now, what did the plane do? The planes in these missions I do, we typically fly below the cloud, in the cloud, and then above the cloud, because you've got to sample the whole column to really understand the system. There's lots of feedbacks between the environment and the cloud. So uh, after we collect these data, we go analyze them. And uh, this is just a little video to give an idea of what a flight looks like off the coast of California. So here we are below the cloud, in the cloud, and now we're above the cloud. It's much drier and warmer and more polluted above a cloud. And then near the end of the flight, which is coming up, you'll see a massive smoke plume above us. This was two years ago. Um, there's a big fire by Big Sur. Um, we'll see it pretty soon above the plane. Uh, right there, there's a big plume. <laughs> so. That's what a flight looks like. We do this over and over and over each summer if we get funding and we usually get 70 flight hours per mission. Um, if you wanna see what it looks like when we chase a cargo ship, I've chased upwards of about 60 of them. This is what it looks like. It's gonna get really bumpy behind the ship due to the wake. So that's kind of what it looks like. It's, it's a very expensive video game for me, honestly. That's what it kind of amounts to. My students really love being in the back with me, uh, get training as flight scientists. So this is the puzzle that the community is trying to piece together. And unfortunately, what happens is in these field campaigns, we go out, we have funding for a few flights, instruments sometimes work when they work want, they and you don't get all the data you need to really disentangle meteorology and aerosol. So at most, we are left with maybe addressing one or two of these arrows pretty well. But honestly, you gotta understand the whole system together. That's the issue we have in our field. We need statistics, and it's so hard to do this with airplanes, just because of the expensive nature of these missions. So just to give an idea, particles go into the cloud with updrafts. Some of them grow enough to fall down as rain and they scavenge the particles under the cloud. And this just begins to get into all the stuff that happens. And there's a whole bunch of stuff happening above the clouds that matter too. So uh, we've done a lot of missions over the last few years off the coast of California, all funded by the Navy because they care about the coastal zone for battle space operations and things. So we get the basic science data they need to improve their weather forecasting. Um, so we've done upwards of 140 flights. Um, we've documented all of our work, our data for the public to use. And in this recent article in BAMS, I sort of did a reflection on all of these flights and what we've learned. 
And this paper was really a motivator for a brand new mission that NASA funded uh, called Activate, which is really the next step forward in how the community needs to start studying these aerosol cloud interactions. So this is a case of um, uh, something that was funded way too early and completely by surprise. This is a big, um, this is one of these so-called big proposals that requires a year off of teaching and all that. And I was approached by NASA Langley to spearhead a concept and to lead a proposal. And I full well knew this would have no way of getting funded. These usually take three, four times, I think. And then maybe you're lucky, but we, we got lucky on the first shot. Um, so that was exciting. So the, the idea of this program, NASA funds suborbital missions that require long-term sustained measurements to build statistics. So it's perfect for aerosol cloud interaction science. The thing that was sort of unique about our flight design was we'd have two airplanes as shown here in this picture, a King Air and what's called an HU-25 Falcon. Uh, and these two fly in synchrony together um, off the coast of, uh, off the East Coast. And we wanna do the same flight path over and over and over and over to build robust statistics, okay? So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a $30 million mission because these flights are so darn expensive. So there's only half of that left for science. So we have a lot of partnering agent institutions. And again, the, the goal is to build an unprecedented data set for the international community to use for aerosol cloud interactions. And we have a big modeling team in our, our, uh, our project. Um, so it's, it's very exciting. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what we're doing. We're planning for 150 joint flights over three years. We just finished our first year. Um, however, COVID has put a wrench in absolutely everything for not just our project, but the other four that were uh, funded. So again, this is the flight concept. Uh, two planes flying in synchrony. The Falcon, is doing what we call in situ measurements in the boundary layer. It's measuring all the gases, aerosol, cloud properties, where the clouds are. The top plane looks down with what are called remote sensors. Okay, so this is NASA funded, so they care about remote sensing. So we have what's called a LIDAR and a polarimeter looking down from that plane, giving us more details of things that the bottom plane could not measure related to the aerosol and clouds. And this is not, uh, someone on a parachute, these are what are called drop zones, which we launch every couple hours or so to get a vertical profile of all the weather parameters. So what used to take a long time with one plane, now we can do very quickly with two planes. And this is really the right way to do it because when one plane reaches the top of the cloud, it's no longer representative of the bottom of the cloud. And plus two planes, you can carry more instruments. So the region was also chosen because all of the planes, the instrument teams were based out of Langley. So we save money just to do more flights. So a lot of these missions go to places like Africa, South America, and they lose a lot of money right off the table just for logistical and travel purposes. But we based right at home to save money. And not only that, this region off the coast here provides a diverse range of aerosol conditions and cloud conditions, which we need. So one of the things we're really interested in, which some of you familiar with East Coast climatology might be aware of, are what are called cold air outbreaks. These are is something I don't really know about because I grew up in Tucson, but <laughs> I've been told in the Northeast, this happens commonly in the winter. Um, we just flew a bunch of flights in these. Really ice cold air from the Northeast, when that travels over a warm ocean surface, you get these streets of clouds called, these are post-frontal clouds, and they can grow and become what are called shallow cumulus clouds, which are notoriously screwed up in models. And so we are collecting data to hopefully um, help fix that problem. These are the two planes side by side. Um, this bottom right plane kind of gives you an appreciation for the instrumentation. We we put on these, these are all just different inlets, honestly, to bring in air different ways for specific instruments that like the sample in certain specific conditions. These are our sort of our flight map concept. We're based out of NASA Langley Research Center, but we have other bases where we could actually go land at, refuel, and then come back. Uh, with COVID, of course, we cannot really do this anymore, but who knows, if things improve a lot in a year or two, maybe we could fly out to Bermuda, which would give us greater spatial range. 
our flights are typically four hours. I'm not going to get into this, but we have a huge modeling component, models of various scales that will be used with our data to really advance understanding of aerosol cloud interactions. Okay, so this, uh, we were cut short in March in our flights. The, the idea was to fly February, March, take a break, and then fly May and June. But we were cut short in March when the cases of COVID started going up. And we had to leave the hangar basically right away. We couldn't even do final calibrations to even have usable data from our past flights. They just said, get the, get the heck off base, don't come back. And then we didn't really think we'd get back into the hangar for until maybe 2021. Um, but with a lot of communication and patience, um, you know, the communication between our, our project team, NASA Langley, the hangar people, we developed a safe, cautious plan to let us return to work, just a bare minimum of us, to finish calibrations and then actually to start redoing our summer flights. So we actually flew 18 flights in uh, August and September. And we had a lot of safety plan for this, you know, masks, disinfection, minimizing who's on the plane. And we, there's a couple stories written about us about making a careful return to flight. Um, all the other missions in this program have basically been canceled. Ours was the only one to go because of the lucky advantage that everyone was based at Langley. There was no external people needing to travel. So the associate administrator of NASA like what we were doing, his name is Thomas Serbuk, and he visited us on our last flight, shown here with a mask. Um, so anyways, the big question mark is what's gonna happen next year? It's not looking very good. But for now, we have good data from 2020. And I'd just like to show one example of the type of data we got. This is a little bit dense scientifically, but I'm gonna try to boil it down in a very simple way, just to show you how the two plane thing works pretty well. So satellites in space, especially um, what are called LIDARs, like to look down and get curtains of aerosols. And based on something called depolarization, can tell you if it's sea salt or dust or urban pollution or something else. So these sensors do what's called aerosol typing. Now, in one of these flights here on the top left, you can see we have very high depolarization next to the ocean. And this is really strange because usually this means that you have dust because dust is non-spherical. Depolarization tells you about sphericity. If you have high depolarization, you're non-spherical. And it kind of made no sense to us that we'd have this much dust right over the ocean. What it could be is sea salt, but everyone knows that sea salt is very hygroscopic. That's a fancy word for meaning it takes up water right away and it becomes a sphere. Otherwise it's cubic in nature. But this is where that second plane matters, the bottom one. We were able to fly in the boundary layer and we detected sea salt and that it was very dry in certain flights like this one where we had high depolarization. So the implication of all this is that satellite data that are archived might be mistyping a lot of sea salt as dust. So this is just one success story of the type of thing our mission is geared towards doing. Okay, so I'm going to pivot now um, away from the, the climate research. Um, there's other research my group does, um, for instance, looking at mining around Arizona, air quality around the world. But I'm just for the sake of time going to switch to the COVID research going on because um, it's timely. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of misleading information, of course, um, in the news, uh, as expected. And well, World Health Organization has also botched up some of their messaging, unfortunately. So this article on the top left got a lot of attention. Um, it had a, some 239 signatories. I was one of them. And this was a really important article to help the World Health Organization get their act together to say, hey, this is airborne, okay? You gotta wear your damn masks. Okay, before that, they were flip-flopping for whatever reasons. I, I, don't, I don't wanna get into that. There's been other high profile papers in science um, showing pictures like this, of course, if both people are wearing masks. That's the best scenario. Um, but a big issue, at least in the internal aerosol community, has been what size should we use as a threshold to separate what people consider aerosols versus droplets? First off, I think that's kind of silly in itself because all of these are aerosols. Aerosols are technically defined as liquid or solid 
particles, and that includes droplets. But this droplet designation has usually been thought to be above five micron, which is incorrect. Aer aerodynamically, it should really be above 100 micrometer because those are the ones that when you talk and cough and sneeze that fall like missiles, ballistic missiles down that fall within two meters in front of you in a few seconds. Okay, um, everything below that, now in the literature we say call those aerosols, everything below 100 micron. Those do not necessarily fall down in two meters in a few seconds. They can hang around, okay? So this, you know, the majority of the, the transmission is in these aerosols that just hang around the room. So this is why it's so important to have, you know, not just the masks and social distancing and all the hygiene cleaning surfaces, um, but moving as much stuff outdoors as possible. And if you're indoors, filtration, ventilation, these things are key. Um, so, you know, I've, I have a newborn at home, a toddler, I, uh, we said forget it about daycare. I'm just terrified of indoor environments, honestly. That's me personally. But uh, this is a, <clears throat> the messaging has gotten more accurate over time and this is an aerosol issue, okay? It's not, this, this six feet thing is, it's good, but <laughs> that's not even close to the full story, okay? It's what's going on all around you. These aerosols are accumulating if you don't have ventilation. Now, um, one thing that's happened, uh, I've, my group has become a little popular at the medical school. Um, so we've been working with different teams on various types of aerosol tests. So we, one of our mature projects has been with a team testing different masks. You've probably heard of N95 masks, um, if you're following this whole story of COVID. What that means is that these masks are 90% effective at removing particles with 0.3 micron diameter. That's just the way it's defined, I guess. So we wanted to test those masks in addition to a bunch of 3D printed masks we've been making that are N99 with better elastomeric linings for better sealing. Uh, so this is our lab setup. You know, we have a little box here with a mannequin. We put our masks on, hook it up to an artificial lung simulator, and we inject aerosol at a fixed size of 0.3 micron and just measure what gets through the mask. And so here's a plot on the right. Red is the background of no mask at all. You're just breathing everything in. N95 is in green, shown to be removing about 50% of the particles, not 95. Okay, this is just due to the ceiling. It doesn't mean the filter was made poorly. It's the ceiling is the problem. And then blue is N99, which is more realistically close to 99. It's more like 90 to 95% filtration. So we showed here um, that 3D printed masks, the whole N99 masks are better than 95 and that ceiling is a really big deal. So this is just an example of something going on. My team was at the medical school yesterday working with some ENT surgeons because they're especially worried about transmission with where they're operating with ear, nose and throat. So that's a little taste of uh, what's going on. And uh, with that, this is my last slide, just a little pop out animation. Uh, to have you appreciate good pictures, uh, have positive thinking, because there's uh, not too much of that these days. But yeah, there's a lot of good things out there to enjoy, like this uh, picture of nature. <laughs> so with that, I, I uh, appreciate any uh, discussion and questions, if anyone has any. Um, wow, well, thank you very much. Welcome. I mean, that it was Incredible. So we have um, had a few questions here in the chat. And um, actually, if you stop sharing the screen, okay. Sure, I'll, let me stop. Yeah, it seems like uh, we've really got a, quite a few people. Welcome, everybody. Um, well, one of our early questions uh, was, do changes from Let's, Leslie Watson, do changes in the duration and opacity of cloud cover have a measurable effect on climate models? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's really what it comes down to. You know, how long lived are these clouds and what is their opacity? So that's basically at the heart of what we're trying to do. Um, it's it's one, one of the thoughts out there is that if you have a more polluted cloud, like I showed you in my cartoon, you suppress precipitation and therefore the cloud can live longer. So it has longer duration. But 
with all these things, there's ifs, ands, and buts. Um, there's caveats to that, and it's not that perfect to just simplify. Um, there's so many different factors at play that are hard to, again, disentangle. Um, that's what makes it so hard to simulate this stuff in, in models. But yes, the, the easy answer is definitely these changes have a measurable effect on models. That's why that error bar is so big in that IPCC chart. Yeah. Okay, and uh, another question that was in the chat. Uh, what is it about the New England Atlantic that gives it such a variety of conditions? Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question. Um, so just the meteorological setup of that part of the world is quite unique in that it, it gives rise to a range of temperature conditions, wind conditions, um, upper tropospheric conditions. So just to give an idea on the West Coast where I've spent most of my career flying up and down, we usually are limited to what are called stratocumulus clouds, these low lying clouds they reside right above the water. They're very important for reflectivity and they are long lived, but they're not very thick clouds. They don't make a lot of rain. Over the east, you know, the western North Atlantic Ocean, because of the different meteorology, we get not only those strata cumulus clouds, but much thicker cumulus clouds, thunderstorms. We get a whole range of clouds. So we get a variety of cloud types, but not just that, when it comes to aerosols, We've got almost everything that arrives there. Uh, you know, believe it or not, Saharan dust is a frequent feature um, in the summertime. I didn't have time to get into it, but this summer we sampled Western wildfire smoke off the East Coast many days. It was hard to avoid it. So we have smoke, we have dust, we have urban pollution, just the outflow from North America. Uh, we have the marine emissions from the ocean. We have biomass burning from the Southeast US, Mexico, the Yucatan, Central America, even smoke from Siberia and the West Coast uh, reaches this region. So lots of aerosol types just because of the position of where this place is and meteorology is just unique. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. And I think a lot of people in my field have avoided doing this type of science there because it's so hard. It's much easier to do it off the California coast because you're you've got these gentle, sweet strata cumulus clouds that are easy to fly in. Yeah, and I'm I'm learning about the region every, every day. I mean, it, this this whole thing's new to me. I, I have no exposure to the East Coast until this project got funded. Yeah. So I, I'm I actually got the chat open. Um, oh, okay, so you can see, see them. Is there um, another question? Uh, so Michael Garcia um, is talking about asking a question about uh, how your research may inform policy, especially with respect to the lack of boundaries from aerosols, and yet uh, policymakers uh, saying that they can actually no, people. people they can prevent. People. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is this is a difficult one. Um, I, I think this is a this is an international issue. Um, you know, so like things that have happened in recent years with the United States sort of ducking out of certain uh, you know uh, protocols or whatever you want to call them. Um, there has to be buy-in, I think, from all countries in terms of reducing emissions at some point to some level. That's that's a good step in a good direction. Um, other than that, I, I will note that most of these problems that have to do with intercontinental transport are natural aerosols. Okay, so you can go regulate the hell out of you out of things like coal, coal combustion, vehicular exhaust, whatever, but those things are going to pale in comparison to dust and wildfire and biomass burning. And um, sea salt's not that much of an issue, but dust and fires are, um, I, I, that's a tricky one, okay? It's not like you can go hose down the whole Gobi Desert, just like the mines like to do around here to prevent dust emissions. That, that is a hard one. So I, I don't know how, how we can uh, uh, penalize or regulate natural environments. But that, that is a uh, excellent question that I've, I've thought a lot about, a lot of people have. It's not an easy one to deal with. 
Yeah. Uh, Carol Rose asks, uh, do you have you do you have enough data to say anything about the effects of aerosol use in geoengineering? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so we we uh, that experiment I showed you where we went out with the ship um, that was in some ways um, climate engineering in that we went to generate a ship track by ourselves. Um, I will note that over a two week period where we tried this some 12 days, it only worked that one day. So questions are why did it not work the other days? Um, well, some days there's just no clouds. Okay, some days the clouds are too high and the plume cannot reach it. Some days you have what's called a decoupled cloud where um, it comes into the thermodynamic structure of the atmosphere where there's a temperature inversion and the cloud is above that inversion. So whatever you're emitting at the surface cannot reach it. Okay. Um, so anyways, and then some days you have so much fog over the ocean that it scavenges the plume before it can even reach a cloud. And then sometimes when it reaches the cloud, it actually can have the opposite effect where it could burn off the cloud. And I, I had some backup slides about that. Right? We actually did a study on this. But uh, it's interesting, depending on the free tropospheric conditions, that's a fancy word for the air above the cloud. If it's dry, if it's extremely dry, if you have a ship, you, through a chain of events, can actually burn off the cloud. And that, so, <laughs> Um, and that has to do with, because if you make a lot of small droplets near the cloud top, just through, again, a chain of events, this enhances turbulence and mixing, bringing in dry air from above into your cloud and it dries it out. So in fact, on some days, if you see these bright lines, not only can you see shipping lanes from space, but some days you might see what I call anti-ship tracks, where again, those might be shipping lanes, but it's just really dry air above the cloud. It's, it's fascinating. Okay, so you might wonder some days outside, why do you not see jet contrails? Okay, it's, it's kind of apples and oranges, but it's kind of similar. Thermodynamics really matters in how this stuff works. And you cannot control thermodynamics with no matter how much money you have. Okay, you can spend a lot of money doing these flights, seeding clouds to make them rain or to make them more polluted, but um, it's a complete waste of money when it comes to the cloud brightening idea for geoengineering. Now, there's other ideas out there that I think have more merit. Um, I've been working a lot with folks at um, Harvard who uh, are really, um, Harvard University of Washington are amongst the leading groups looking at um, geoengineering ideas like um, uh, simulating volcanoes. So stratospheric aerosol injection. That one to me has more merit. Um, that's like simulating a Mount Pinatubo where you go inject a bunch of stuff into the stratosphere. And that's a perfect place to stick your aerosol because they don't settle very fast up there. There's no clouds and moisture to rain it all out. So that stuff just hangs out. But as with all of this stuff, it gets into ethical issues, unintended consequences. Uh, people don't understand the chemistry of what you can actually do in the stratosphere if you go inject a bunch of sulfuric acid or other species. We, we don't know. So um, another crazy idea, um, might not be crazy in a few years, I don't know, but dumping dust into the oceans. <laughs> There's nutrients like iron that can kickstart and make the food chain happy. And as microorganisms grow, they take up CO2. So it's like carbon sequestration. Um, so unintended consequences there, acidification of the ocean, coral reef quality, I mean, uh, the list is long. So I, my, I've been involved a lot in meetings, discussions about geoengineering. Um, scientifically, it's quite interesting to me. Um, I, I don't advocate necessarily for it until we have more information to understand the science. There's so many unintended consequences that we don't understand. So but that's, that's a really interesting topic that a lot of people are pursuing. It's gaining a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question. Oh, um, Scott wanted to ask a question and then Robert, you've got your hand up. Anybody else afterwards? Okay. Hi, Hi Armin. I appreciate uh, your concluding picture from 
originating in the Amazon. Yeah, I, that was for you, Scott. I, I knew you would join. Uh, yeah. Which is one of the big sources of biogenic aerosols in the world. Um, but actually, and, uh, actually, I had a sort of more policy or you know, communication of science question, which was, do you have any insights from your work on the COVID uh, aerosol question about why there was such resistance in the WHO to sort of accepting that science about aerosols? Uh, it seemed really a puzzling um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I could give you a really good answer after a couple beers. Um, I, I don't know who's on this call, but I mean, I, my, my, my answer is probably the same answer you have. I mean, there's stuff that's ex is beyond science that I think pisses off a lot of people that it was at the heart of some of this misleading information. I, but I, <laughs> I don't want to go into too much detail on that. I, 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 I can just tell you in the aerosol community, which I was active in these discussions with some of those first papers. I mean, I wasn't a lead author by any means, but I was involved with email chains going on between these 239 signatories and um, of one of those key papers that really made WHO change their mind. Um, we had our act together from the beginning. It, it, we, um, some people like Kim Prather at, at UCSD was always on the news. Uh, telling various stations, um, you know, how this stuff really works. Um, it just took a lot of time. I, again, I, it's unfortunate, but we, we on the expert side had our act together right at the beginning. So we had stuff out in science, uh, various journals. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I don't know if that's a satisfying yeah, answer. But. Be a beer. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Robert, you had a question? Oh, you're muted. Uh, Armin, uh, this has been a fabulous presentation. I'm just so uh, proud of what you're doing uh, for you and your family and the university. It's just fabulous stuff. Thank so, you. I have one question. Two questions. One sort of a professional question as a water guy. I was kind of shocked to hear about these sea salt particles. I thought when, when the evaporation occurred, you ended up with fresh water and you're disabusing me of that. Uh, do they eventually precipitate out or are these clouds carrying some levels of salt over the land mass that then gets um, precipitated out once they, they hit land? That's the first question. Okay. And the second question is, do you fly commercial? <laughs> and, and where, what oh. advice do you have for people flying commercial? So. Yeah, uh, well, uh, so you, uh, the second question sounds easier. You mean fly commercial these days with what's going on? Yes. Oh, um, no. I, I have not um, uh, vulnerable age groups in the house, um, and I don't need to. Uh, my parents live in Irvine. We can just drive there. Um, yeah, mother-in-law, diabetes, two brand new kids. Uh, yeah, it's just, we don't need to. Um, uh, and I, I have not done any research or investigated the literature on airborne platforms, commercial, but um, the, the little I know and from my expertise, I would, I would not feel terribly comfortable on a commercial plane. Uh, but that, I know way too much. I get uncomfortable just sitting outside Campbell like on a prep and pastry next to the street because I know I'm inhaling aerosols from cars. Nobody in their right mind should have those worries, but I know too much about my field. Okay, so that's, that's who you're asking about these, uh, this issue. So I'm, I'm a little bit more cautious and um, I, 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 I would wait um, as long as possible to have to fly. Um, I would I would wait till a family emergency really warranted it, and um, still I would be nervous. The first question, um, yes. So clouds are amazing at taking stuff from one area to another area. So sea salt over the ocean is one of the best seeds of cloud droplets. So we've done flights off the east coast, west coast. I didn't even talk about it today, but we just finished a huge campaign in Southeast Asia, flying over the Philippines and neighboring areas. And one of our measurements is we collect cloud water on the plane and we measure what's in the cloud water and not just those measurements, but there's monitoring stations across the United States looking at wet deposition chemistry, you know, with rain gauges. You collect it and you take it to the lab, do ion chromatography, see what's in the water. It's usually dominated by sea salts, no matter where we've gone. 
Okay, part of this though is because sea salt is big. It, 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 it really has a big influence on mass. It doesn't really tell you much about the number. So there could have been a lot of smaller particles seeding the clouds, but just a few sea salt particles that are big really dominate mass in these chemical measurements. So those clouds, of course, can go over land, rain, fall down, deposits, nutrients, uh, contaminants, species like sea salt. Um, we've seen a whole host of different elements being emitted from a ship that can be deposited over land, things like vanadium, things that are bad, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, when you have a cloud droplet, rain droplet, and it falls or evaporates, it leaves the, the seed particle. Okay, the, 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 the original seed particle, by the way, changes a lot from when it first made the drop to when it got out of the droplet after evaporation. It probably grew in size and changed in its chemistry due to reactions. These droplets are amazing and efficient chemical reactors. Lots of fascinating chemistry. That's a whole branch of research itself to see what's going on in these drops. That was actually most of my PhD doing all these types of measurements in clouds. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Robert. Okay, I'm not sure I see any more questions in the chat, but uh, anyone out there would like to jump in with a question here with our, it's just fascinating. I, I appreciate, these are some really nice questions. Thank you. I appreciate you all joining uh, on a day like today. So, I mean, what, what, what is your, what, what, what big question do you feel you uh, still needs to be addressed? What, what are you really chasing after now? What, what keeps you up at night? Yeah, so uh, I, again, all, most of my work has really been rooted in these, these interactions between these particles and clouds. And it, it's, it's not so much like a really juicy question, it's like just, understanding it better and reducing that error bar, that's, that's really where it's at. And um, everything thus far has been looking at little processes one by one, but I'm, what I'm trying to get at, it's hard, is a new paradigm, a new approach to look at this thing as a system. And that's kind of hard to do. Uh, we don't necessarily have the data yet in my opinion, but with this activate mission we're doing, I think at the end we'll have data, um, but it's developing a new framework, a new way of thinking about these interactions, just a new way of approaching it. I don't know if it's gonna involve machine learning, all these fancy things that are gaining traction. I think it's gonna be a combination of different tools and methods and expertise. So I, I would say that is, is a, and just simply just educating people on simple stuff like, um, Particles are not gases, particles cool the planet. Uh, whenever I'm on a commercial flight, back when I flew, um, I was have fascinating conversations with whoever sat next to me. I was just dumbfounded by how little they know about how things work. And I always appreciated the opportunity for an hour or two hours on a flight to Denver to educate at least one person. And I, I still don't know if I convinced them at the end of the flight that global warming, climate change is real. But I, I think what works best is when you talk about health. That's something they can understand and appreciate and say, oh, okay, maybe it makes sense to regulate stuff if it's killing me. So that's, <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, those are types of things I think about, just educating people on simple stuff and the big picture of framework of how to think about these aerosol cloud interactions, how to advance the field, just new paradigm. That's what I'm thinking about. Uh, Tony has just thrown in a, a question. Tony Massaro, I feel like he does about aerosols, but for me, it's news about the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What news? Uh, well, I, I she's saying, any news? Too. Yeah. I I missed that. Was that a question to well, me? Well, lucky yeah. if anybody gets to. Next to either Armin or Tony in an, an airplane, they're very lucky people. Right. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so thank you, everyone. Um, I appreciated the chance to talk to you. Thank you, Armin. Oh, yeah. oh, I'll be thank back you. in I'll be back in ten years again.
with an update. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Bye.